Welcome. Welcome to the Nature Journal Workshop. This is a special edition uh, today. Um, uh, I am being helped by my, my co-host, uh, Melinda. Thank you up there. Really appreciate uh, you handling the logistics in this. And um, we, are, we have two uh, guests today. Um, I'd like to introduce to you folks uh, up here in this corner. Um, this is Bill Lycom, and he is the fox guy um, and is an amazing steward of nature and um, old school, curious, investigative uh, uh, biologist who's figuring out what's going on with urban wildlife. Um, and um, my, my guest over here, I'm delighted to introduce you folks to, to, to Marsha Sivit. Hi there, Marsha. Um, the other, other direction. Oh, or, or on my screen, she's over there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's oh, sorry. So yeah, so you have to, you, to, to pretend you're looking at me, you look this, this, there, there you go. So high five, ready? Oh, oh there oh, we go. <laughs> we'll work it out. <laughs> um, so um, Marsha, um, is the host of Be Provided Conservation Radio. And so she finds, uh, she's actually how I learned about Bill. Um, she finds people who are doing amazing conservation things all over the world. And um, you can learn more about um, her. Uh, let's, 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 we'll, we'll put your, your, your websites and things into the, the chat. Yeah. Um, um, and we are delighted to have you with us. Um, Marsha is going to help us kind of uh, unravel a lot of the cool things that Bill is, is up to. Bill is going to fill us in on all these neat things. Then we're going to do a little bit of how do you draw a gray fox. And these are going to be some tricks that you did not learn before. Oh, you got the gray fox before. This is, this is next level. And so we'll, we'll do those tricks and strategies. And then we're going to be returning um, to this group for um, questions and answers from you. So if you have questions about urban wildlife and um, uh, that you would, uh, would that you'd like to, uh, to to ask Bill, um, this is you can put those into the chat. And um, at so there'll be a question and answer session at the end. And then we're also at the after that we're going to be doing some journal sharing. If you've been drawing gray fox or um, other cool things. So um, everybody, we are really delighted to have you all here. And thank you, thank you so much for, um, for, for being with us. Um, so let's, uh, let's, let's turn it over to, to Marsha and Bill. Um, for a uh, an, an exploration of the the work that you are doing and a little bit about urban wildlife and these uh, the wonderful foxes. That sounds great. So really, I'm just here to draw foxes today. <laughs> I love I love gray fox, and I I met Bill through a mutual friend um, of John's and and Bill's and uh, Beth Pratt through an interview and um, she talked highly of the Fox guy and I had to find out who, who this was. And so I found Bill and contacted him and I just have always loved foxes and I learned so much in our interview. So thank you, Bill. And we've been keeping in touch in email and he, he has a wonderful newsletter. Um, so please sign up for that. And it, it keeps you up to date on what's happening with the foxes in the Bay, Bayland area. And other than that, I just I was I was so excited with his story, and he's probably um, the best expert I know for no knowing the behavior of the foxes. He follows them every day, um, and keeps track with them. So I'm sure he'll share that story. But but anyways, thank you, and I hope I'm sure you're all going to fall in love with gray fox as well. So Excellent. thanks, Bill. Yeah, well, I, I hope everybody, you know, uh, falls in love with the gray fox because this this little fox is is uh, to say the least unique. Um, and uh, well, since I brought that up, maybe I should give you one little example of how unique it is. Um, it is the gray fox that is the what we call the basal 
uh, canid. Okay, it's the it's the only it's the fox that forms the basis for all other foxes. It uh, is ten million years old. It's older than wolves, jackals, any other canine on the planet, and it's thriving. Um, there are a few places where it isn't, but uh, the, the gray fox is, is a survivor. Let me put it that way. And uh, so what it, the question sometimes is asked, what are you doing out there? You know, what really are you doing? Well, what I'm doing is trying to, f tr trying to plumb the depths of uh, the behavior of these foxes. Uh, when it comes to wildlife in general, we do not know enough about the wildlife that's out there to really make many good judgments. And uh, so I'm shedding light on uh, the gray fox as my subject, just simply because when I first saw them, um, both when I was a kid of about 14 years old, and then when I, in, in my 60s, uh, I came across them again. And the second time I came across them again, uh, it, it became a compulsion for me to study the behavior of these foxes. And now it's been 11 years. This is the 11th year that I have been doing this work. I'm out in the field twice a day, once in the early morning before it even gets light out there. I'm collecting the SD cards out of the trail cameras. And those trail cameras show me behaviors that I would never see in the daytime. So I'm logging all that in. I've got a log of a more than a million words. And uh, all of that led to the development of the Urban Wildlife Research Project. In 2016, all of the gray foxes in the Palo Alto Baylands Nature Preserve between Adobe Creek and San Francisco Creek died of canine distemper. And when that happened, I thought to myself, there's got to be something within the system that these foxes live in that is causing this disease. So what I found out from the state of California, uh, the veterinarian for the state of California, was that the canine distemper is endemic all over the state of California. And so I got to thinking, what can we do to help with the health of the wildlife out there? I came to the conclusion that part of the problem was there's not enough, uh, not enough habitat for them to all occupy. They get crowded. They get into population densities that are, that are unhealthy. And so what we're going to do is we're going to expand the habitat so that there's more places for the foxes, for the raccoons, for the possums, for the wood rats, for all the wildlife that's out there, larger territories, so that that then should increase the health of the total environment. And that's going to run, well, at first it's going to be limited to between the Palo Alto Baylands and Moffett Field, which is about uh, a four mile stretch, probably maybe a little bit more. And uh, that's gonna be our test zone. And then we're going to expand it from Redwood City to Albizo. So, that's where we're at. Um, I think I've learned some pretty important things about these uh, little critters. One of the things is that their intelligence is different from ours. And by different, I mean that we use our eyes to sense everything in, around us. We're, we're constantly using our visual they don't. 
they are hearing and smelling their world the same as we are seeing ours. And that means a whole lot when it comes to all those neurons that are popping up in their brains. So, uh, Bill, you, you shared a story on the podcast about them solving problems, um, like getting over the branch, over the water, that they all, you saw a family think differently. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. 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 Do you know what I'm talking about? Right. I do know what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. I'll, I'll share that with the, the audience then. And, and what happened was that uh, I was going into a wooded area uh, actually this area that's right behind me on the screen to take care of my trail cameras. And during that period of time, this was prior to 2016, during that period of time, sometimes the foxes would follow me. And so on this particular occasion, uh, I looked back behind me and there were three foxes. One was a young fox. Another one was uh, the uh, alpha female of the region. And another one was the young fox's mom, who I called cute. By the way, I named these foxes. <laughs> Uh, I give them names based on sometimes the color, sometimes the personality, uh, various reasons. Um, so cute, for instance, when I first saw that little fox, I thought, whoa, that's the cutest little fox I've ever seen. <laughs> and that's how it got its name. So cute, uh, dark eyes, and the young, um, male, big guy. Ahead of me was a channel with water in it. These foxes do not like water on their feet. They're like cats in many ways. As a matter of fact, I used to call them the canine that acts like a feline. And so they stopped. I, I, I waded out and across the water. They stopped at the edge of the water. The young one just simply, he, he, he just walked his way right through the water and everything. Cute, his mom, she held back. She didn't like water at all. And she was thinking about how she was going to get across this water without getting her paws wet. Well, in looking at the situation, she decided if I jump from here over to that willow over there, I can probably make that leap. And then I'm, I'm scot-free, I'm, I'm all the way in. I, uh, I'd be over the water. And that's what she did. She leapt, I mean, they, they can really jump, okay? She leapt all the way across. And the third one, dark eyes, who's the alpha female of the region, she held back still more. And finally, having seen where I went, she chose to go the same route. She got her feet wet, but not very much. She, she was able to keep eh, the edge of the water, okay? Three different ways of confronting the same challenge. And that told me a lot about, they don't all think the same. And uh, that's just one example. There's, there's a lot more to these gray foxes than just their intelligence. Okay. Who, who, are be, who is behind you? Is that uh, Big Eyes and Lamos or? No, oh, behind me now. Yeah. Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. This, this is, um, this is Lamos, uh, the male, and this is his mate, um, Big Eyes, the female. 
We can't see your pointing on your, is it big eyes standing or? Yeah, big eyes are standing. Okay. Okay, and beautiful. He, he's lying down. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Okay. Well, with that, I think we could probably <laughs> want the drawing part of the event here. And then uh, toward the toward the end, I'll, I'll come back in and make some comments or make some comments along the way. I don't know how Jack is going to do this. But. Yeah, yeah, feel free to, anytime you want to make a comment, drop those bad boys in. And um, I would, would love to, to, to hear from you as, as things are going along. Okay. Um, I'm now going to show people some tricks and strategies on drawing the fox. And um, what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be looking at today sort of speed drawing the fox. And so I'm going to show you kind of, kind of what my gesture drawing looks like for quickly getting the shape in. And then I'm going to, I found online a, a little documentary that was made about Bill and the stuff he was doing. It had a bunch of great fox footage in it. So I've taken that and um, so you'll see just, you know, videos of foxes moving around and they move. They are crazy agile, as you'll see. And so this is, we're going to get first an idea of how you'd approach kind of quick sketching something. And then um, we're going to have a chance to, to, to do that with some um, live footage of very active little foxes. And that'll be fun. Yeah. Um, so the goal here is not a slow, careful, whisker by whisker drawing. We want to try to be able to get that sense of gesture sketch of fox in motion that feels like a fox in motion. And as we're going, either uh, let's take those questions that you have for Bill. Right now, we have the fox guy online with us. So we want to make sure we take advantage of that. Um, and uh, so put your foxy questions into the chat. Right there. All right. <clears throat> Here we go. Uh, let's see. I am going to change my camera over to this. There's my camera. Um, so I just want to, I'm going to show you all just a few little ideas of, 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 of kind of gesture sketching the fox. So I'm using really um, uh, fancy tools here. I've got a ballpoint pen. Um, and so in this, I'm not even going to be first blocking it in with the non-photo blue pencil. I'm going to be just diving in and directly drawing right here with this, uh, with this, with this ballpoint pen. Um, now you can use uh, one strategy people can do is, is to block things in with your non-photo blue pencil or a light pencil and then go over that. But when I'm sometimes if I'm if things are really active, just you know the the time wasted in switching from one tool to the other, ah, right, is too much for my brain. So um, when the fox pops up and it's moving around doing its things couple of strategies for kind of critters on the move. Number one is you don't have to draw a head to tail drawing of the entire thing. So if you kind of like, oh, look at its tail, look the tail, you know, you see a pattern in the tail. If you try to then draw that pattern of just the tail on, you'll get part of the tail drawn and then your brain will go blank. So the trick is that what you want to do is to, while the, the, the action is happening, you're muted. So start to say out loud exactly what you see. So if you say like, oh, dark stripe up most of the way up the tail, the tip is black and really, really wide. And then I'm going to be able to, on the side of my paper, I'm going to get a little tail. And the bottom is black. And then there's a dark stripe that goes up the top of the tail. And so if I, um, if I don't verbalize that, then what happens is partway through your drawing, you're going to forget a bunch of those, 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 those details. So there was just a little thing that I saw. And then you might kind of like, you'll get all, all excited about the tail. 
right? So then I'll, 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 whatever it is, say what you see again out loud. So for instance, I can say, ooh, the tail, it's smoother along the top, it's more shag on the bottom. And so I'm gonna have a little tail shape and it's pretty thick. And- And you know what they use that tail for? Why uh, it's large? They use it uh, when they're climbing in the trees. They're the only canine that can climb trees and uh, they climb it like a squirrel. Anyway, uh, they use that tail for balance. Oh, that, it, it, it's amazing to, to, to see that some of their, 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 their tree climbing prowess. But, well, you know, so here in this little drawing, I have it smooth along the top and I've got just sort of a sense of that more kind of shag on the bottom, right? So say your observations out loud, that's, and, and also be willing just to take a little piece. Like you can't handle the fox, don't worry about the whole fox. Just get some little nugget, some little nugget. Um, say that out loud and you're good to go. Um, when you are kind of trying to get more of the body in, in a quick gesture, the idea is you're going to have some information in your head for a short period of time and you want to transfer it from your hand to the paper before the stuff in your brain goes blank. At a certain point, you're totally just making stuff up um, because it's gone on to all sorts of other poses. So, but while something is still there, um, try to get some stuff down. But I'm going to show you a little bit of anatomy stuff that is going to help you be able to focus where you want to look. So I see, ooh, there's an interesting pose. What I will often do is I'll focus just on the line of its back, All right? So what is the line of its back? So here's its neck coming down, line of its back, there's a corner and down like this. So I'd say uh, coming down steep slope, it's flat, sharp corner and down steep again, same angle, All right? And that is the back of my fox. So then I'm going to hang a head from that. And the neck coming down, the neck attaches into where the rib cage is. So the rib cage is going to give you thickness of, of body up in here. And at the back of, so where the rib cage is, this part of the spine doesn't really bend. But right here, when you go from your thoracic vertebrae into your lumbar vertebrae, your low back vertebrae, that's where the bend happens. So we go, um, expect to, the, the neck to be able to come down, be flexible. Then you get your back. Then you're coming down for your, 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 your hips. So on my little fox here, if I get this line, I'm going to expect to, I'm going to look for and expect to see a little inflection point back here. And then I'm thinking of this body in three sections. There is the upper body out here, kind of a ball for the upper body, then a ball for the guts and tummy here and a ball for the hips. And breaking the, the fox down into these three quick little balls is very, very helpful. If it's turned from the side, from the side, I might get something like this. If this turns towards me more, then here's my head up here, my head ball. Here's my upper chest ball. And here is that back body ball sticking out behind it. And then here is the, the hip ball down below that. So I'm getting then my front legs are going to attach into that upper leg ball. So the front legs attach into this little bit here. Um, let's take another look at things that that spine can do. Um, so I see a fox in a pose. I am going to want to think of what is the line of that critter's back. Right. 
put a head on it. Sometimes you can give your head just a little, like we do with the birds, kind of the top of the snout line. And then I'm thinking of, I have an upper body. I have a tube here for the middle of the body. And I'm gonna have a back ball for my hips down here. And that gives me a lot of useful anatomy. The neck comes down into this, this chest area. Um, and you wanna think of the neck as, as sort, of a, a sort of a flattened tube. And so if I were then to go put, you know, ears on this guy. Your front legs are going to be straight, right? There's a, because the, the elbow is kind of hidden up here in this body, this upper body ball. Part of that is it's the shoulder blade and it actually is goes to the elbow here. So, so the, 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 the front legs come sort of sticking out from that. The back leg I'm gonna just try one more kind of quick little gesture. I see a little pose and I go like, oh, humpback, hump further towards the back of the fox, All right? So I'm gonna draw a little humpback line. And then here is that, that first line, the back of the fox. So, then that gets filled in with three circles for those three sort of masses of the body. So this idea of first looking at the line of the back and then um, the um, sort of those three sort of sections, um, the, the chest, the, the thorax, and then the hip zone. Um, I find that's just sort of a very useful, very, um, very adaptable way of kind of blocking in the shapes of mammals. Gray fox, no exception. But if you wanted them to kind of look alive, this line going down its back, that's where you start. That is the line. If that is a lively line, then you'll get something that has the, a, a drawing that'll have some punch or oomph to it. So what I'm going to do is I am going to share the screen and at first, I'm just going to put up a photograph of a gray fox. And I'd like you just to rapidly draw it, rapidly draw it. And so you're not making one line. You're making a bunch of lines that are, 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 are going to be kind of wrapping over each other. You want your, your, your pen to be moving fast. Our first ones just kind of go for fast gesture form of the fox, all right? Don't worry about getting locked into any kind of detail. And I'm gonna share a screen and here we go. <clears> hey. <throat> 
Hooray for the Urban Wildlife Research Project. Um, did we put the URL for the project in the chat? Yes, we did that earlier at the beginning. I could put that in there again. Okay. Thank you so much, Melinda. I really appreciate your help. All right, so here's a fox. So before before you put any marks down on paper, let's just, just look at this. I want you to, I'm gonna actually turn the, my, my camera to, to point at me. Um, let's see. Our, I don't think I can do it from this view. Never mind. I'm not. Um, but um, well, no, don't come back, Fox. Give me that other Fox. Don't go there yet. Um, escape. Um, hold on. I'm going to stop this um, sharing for just one minute. Kind of get my <laughs> act back together on my slideshow. No. Oh. Um, and. Also put on the jack cam. Um, so, so Jack, we we've accumulated some questions for Bill. So when there's a good a good point, just to let you know where we've got some some questions for him. Okay, let me demonstrate one thing, and then we're going to um, then we're going to jump over on to these will be going on. We can ask questions while people are are, are drawing. Right. So what I want you to do when this picture is first up, take your pen, close one eye, and and I want you just to sort of draw in the air, take the tip of your pencil, and like if you're drawing me, you'd be tracing around the shape of my head. You'd be going like sort of lining your pencil up with the head. Then he's got a shoulder kind of coming over like this and some neck like this, other shoulder coming out over here, kind of like that. What I want you to do is just to sort of get the feeling of that line is to air draw a couple of times. And I'm going to be looking at you on these little things. So I'm going to see if you're doing some air drawing. Rather than hitting the paper right away, just get some fast air drawing down. And then that's going to help you kind of get the, the oomph and the feeling of this thing, right? And then it's got some bodies this chunky. OK, I'm going to get it, right? Then once you kind of do a little bit of quick air drawing, get those lines down on your paper and get them there fast. On your mark, get set. Um, actually, I'm going to jump. Sure. Here we are. Um, so, air draw. That line coming back. Ooh, look, flat back. See that turn where the, the rib cage ends? All right. So, it's, look for that inflection point. One right there by the hips and the front of the tail. Now transfer that line to your piece of paper. And then see if you can lock in a body mass And from there, you can go on and add to that as you please. And let's now go to question number one for Bill. Okay, Melinda, do you want me to start? Um, um, yeah, sure. Or I wasn't <clears throat> ready with that yet. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry about that. Let's That's talk okay. To let's go to Bill when you're ready. No, we, can, we can totally do that. I'm switching out. I'm, I'm at the document. Um, we've got um, a bunch of questions let's see, related to, I was still adding some more because they, they just keep coming in. Um, but it looks like there's some questions about diet and about just their behavior and then habit, a lot about habitat. So um, I think we've answered some of these, but they're wondering if they're diurnal or nocturnal and if they den. Oh, okay. Uh, they're, <clears throat> they're actually not, diurnal, nor are they strictly nocturnal. They do 75%, about 75% of their hunting uh, time is uh, nocturnal, night uh, time. Although that's not all that they do at night. They run around, they play with each other, they have fun, okay? But as I said, about 75% is, they're actually what we call crepuscular. And crepuscular is a term that's used for an animal that has what we 
might call daylight hours. Okay, so in the in the morning after sunrise, they might you might uh, see them out and about um, for an hour, two hours or so after sunrise, and then in the evening they are out during daylight hours as well. And in the evening, before they launch off to go get uh, their dinner, they um, tend to lay in grassy areas so that uh, they, it's almost as if they, they're watching the sunset. They're getting prepared to go out uh, during, during the night uh, time. So the term is crepuscular. Okay. Great. Thank you. And you said they were hunting. What are they looking for? Someone mentioned that they thought they heard it was a, they were vegetarian part of the year. Oh, they are. Um, they have, they, they are omnivorous, first of all. Okay. But the pattern of their uh, uh, food consumption uh, changes with the seasons. So in the beginning, when the pups are small, by the way, I call them pups and not kits. This is a canine we're talking about, okay? So they're pups to me anyway. Um, so they begin their lives uh, by nursing, then by eating meat um, that is brought back by the parents. And then when we get closer into the summertime, they're eating uh, vegetation, they're eating fruits, uh, they, they'll eat. They, I, have, I have encountered them up in trees eating uh, uh, Italian buckthorn berries, which are purple in color. And what that does is, is when you're at that time of year, you're looking for purple scat on the ground. Okay, it, it's just purple and uh, so, uh, around the Bay Area, okay? Um, that doesn't hold true for everywhere. Uh, so they, they go through a period of, of preferring uh, the vegetation and then they about long about mm, December or so, somewhere in there, they revert back to uh, hunting um, mice, rodents of all kinds. They control the rodent population and the rabbit populations uh, around the Baylands. Uh, when we had the die out in 2016, uh, almost immediately, the uh, foxes um, that had been keeping the rodent population under control, the rodent population went out of control. The rabbit population exploded and uh, created an imbalance in nature out there at the, bay, at the Baylands. And that would happen anywhere that you had a big die out occur. Okay. Great. Um, Jack, did you want to do a little bit more speaking? We have some questions about habitat and restoration we could go to now or later. I, I'm just going to be uh, changing the, these slides. What I want people to do as you're listening, as you're thinking, write down any notes that are kind of relevant to you about this. Um, and so you start to kind of get some written notes on your page about foxness and crepuscularity or whatever it is that is kind of like, oh, I didn't know that. I think I'm gonna wanna remember that. Um, and the, uh, don't get hung up on one drawing. Um, but just try to get yourself, you know, I, I want, if, if you are not making some mistakes with what you're doing right now, you're not trying hard enough, right? So you've got um, permission to kind of, I've got things where like, ooh, that fox has no neck. You know, like that one, you know, the, the neck is too long. It's sort of a giraffe hybrid, but I keep making drawings I keep making sketches and things. Don't go slow. You want to try to get yourself to go faster. Let's go for a couple more of those questions. And well, we draw this one. Yeah, all right, let's see. Um, so there's some question about, let's see, the distemper. 
um, whether canine distemper is something that can spread to humans? Um, no, uh, but it can uh, spread to uh, like uh, raccoons uh, in the area. So if the gray foxes come down with uh, uh, canine distemper, it can be uh, communicated to the uh, raccoon population. There, there are others that uh, can um, suffer from uh, canine distemper, but uh, I'm not really familiar with um, the extent. I do know raccoons, though. Uh, so anyway, so humans, humans you, you wouldn't get canine distemper. Okay. Um, you had mentioned earlier that the distemper is um, endemic in California. And the reason why they had the die off, um, I'm suspected you were mentioning that the, the density of the foxes was too high. And mm -hmm. that by expanding their territory, they can have more space between them and that could control these periodic bursts of distemper. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Um, that by by doing that by connecting up the habitat to make uh, to make it easier for the young uh, foxes to disperse um, they're like they're like teenagers they want to get out of the house uh, when along about nine months eight nine months after they're born and they want to go find themselves a mate and they want to go find themselves uh, the territory that they're going to claim because these little foxes are uh, quite territorial under normal circumstances. Under other circumstances, they learn to live tightly together and all of the fights erupt and, and things like that, but they, they, they tend to get along. So are they um, traveling in family groups and do they um, den together in the evenings? Or actually during the day, possibly. <laughs> yeah, during the day. Uh, for me, the, the only real true den is the natal den where the uh, pups are born. And for the gray fox, that is not a burrow uh, going down into the ground. The, their den is more like in heavily shrub, uh, overgrown shrubbed areas that are difficult uh, for you and I to get into uh, and for other um, uh, critters too. Um, so they, sometimes they, they'll uh, have their pups uh, under a building in the urban setting. Um, and mm, where was I going with that thought? Let me see. What was the second part? It, it was about den, whether they're in groups or solitary and whether they den together. Group, uh, they, 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 form, they form a family, okay? Um, mom, dad, and kids. Uh, and the, that's, that hangs together for about nine months until the young pups disperse. Once they disperse, then the two adults, they hang around with each other. Sometimes I, I, in this one family that I was monitoring and, and documenting, um, Gray, the male, after the pups had left, he would take what I called his vacation, okay? He'd leave Mama Bold uh, at the, uh, in the local area there, uh, and she had her places where she rested during the day and so forth. Um, but he'd take off and go somewhere. And uh, I have no idea where he'd go. He'd, he'd be gone for like two, three weeks at a time. And then he'd come back and they'd resume their relationship. Mm -hmm. um, they are under normal circumstances, they, they mate for life. Okay, so limos and uh, big guys, uh, uh, big guys that you saw on the screen behind me, um, they're, they're about three years old now and they will um, be together for the rest of their lives. 
if the situation is such that it's overcrowded, then you can have divorces within the family, uh, within, yeah, within the family of foxes. And I saw a divorce one time, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and uh, so, and that was back in the day when it was overcrowded. What I'm saying here too is documented by a research project that would, took place in South Carolina, I think it was South Carolina. Anyway, I'm not coming at this just off of what I have observed. This has been backed up by scientific research. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Actually, in that story, you've answered a whole bunch of questions. Someone was concerned about big eyes and um, um, and her mate during in the Baylands during the die off, but it sounds like they were born after the die off. Yeah, they 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 migrated. For, uh, they came in from uh, the shoreline area, which is south. Great. Um, so a, f a few questions about the expansion, um, and I grew up in, in the Palo Alto area visiting the Baylands um, several times a week, and I just am envisioning, I haven't been there in a while, but um, how will you expand? Is it, mo I recall it's mostly marshy habitat, and is that the natural habitat of the foxes? Um, the natural habitat of the foxes is wooded areas, like what's behind me here. In, in this area here. And that's why uh, a lot of people call the gray fox uh, elusive um, because they really seriously prefer living in the, in the woods, in the shelter of the um, uh, trees and brush and bushes and you know, all that, the thickets. Um, and uh, so that is kind of like what they prefer. Red foxes, on the other hand, they like open spaces. Mm -hmm. And so I'm getting off the track of the question, but. No, actually you're, you're answering, you're right spot on. You're answering other questions that have popped up too. So. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna um, just in, interrupt for, for, for a moment because I yeah. just want to, with the drawing, just change the focus slightly. Um, the um, what I want to do is so while this has been going on, these these are the kind of the the, the cluster of sketches that I made of of foxiness, and um, so none of these are kind of detailed worked out things, but you kind of can see those the lines of the back, and then I'm hanging a frame from those, and I'm not worried about one. These sketches are all kind of it's kind of fun to let them overlap each other, and if you get um, a bunch of sketches on a on a page that kind of start to overlap each other in things. You can sometimes also just grab a pencil and color in one. And what that does is just makes some of them, you know, a little bit easier to read. That's, and it's it's fun to have a bunch of these things all going on the on the same page. That's neat. Um, and and what, by, by doing this, it gives me permission to have a bunch of sort of scratchy stuff. And then you end up with this sort of fox collage. <laughs> yeah. And there'll be some on there where you're like, ooh, I like this one's shape too. So I, not so much this guy. This guy um, <laughs> lost its neck. So I'm not going to highlight that one. But this one over here, that's feeling a little bit more foxy. Right, um, so that's a that's a, a, a fun strategy to 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 play with. What we're about to do, though, is I'm going to up the challenge now um, because rather than these static photographs, I'm going to put on a video, and you'll see every once in a while in the video, <laughs> Bill appears because um, <laughs> uh, this was something I, I took off of, of YouTube and it was a documentary about him and his work. And so he's got a few little spots in there, um, but he's on for just a moment and then you're back to some foxes. Um, and you'll notice that they'll be moving around. They won't be holding any one pose. So what you want to do is kind of jump back to that strategy of just take a little piece, or if you can get you know, the, a line of a back 
All right, then you've got you know, some anchor points to work from and get several little parts of things all going on the same page. Um, and, and see if you can sort of be continuously collecting information and recording it on your page. Another way you can do that um, is with words. So if you want to write down um, a black on muzzle, um, white commas surrounding the nose, you can write those out with words. Um, or you can make a little sketch um, showing a dark little nose and put some white commas um, around that and then have, and just sort of say, you know, you can, you know, it doesn't have to be a full face, but I can just have a little kind of nugget of a moment. And I wanted to sort of capture bits and pieces of information on foxes that are moving all around. Um, if it's up in a tree, kind of like, you know, this is the, the, the posture that I saw when it was kind of climbing the tree. Maybe I don't get any, this drawing may not kind of flesh out anymore. Um, or, you know, I might end up, you know, you, you, can, you, can, you can play with that, 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 that some more if you want, but um, try to, rather than just being overwhelmed, like, oh man, it's just moving, 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 I'm locked up. Just playfully capture a little nugget of information and then another little nugget of information, then another little nugget of information. You can't get it all, you're not doing a head to toe portrait, but see if you can get some information, transfer it to paper, get some information, transfer it to paper. Remember those words are also really, really helpful in doing this. Um, while we do this, we can drop some more questions on Bill. Um, and, um, but we just want to kind of play with the fox that is, well, scampering around and being a fox. And play. Yeah, I'll see. Um, Marsha, did you want to um, ask a couple of these questions? Sure, sure, I can do that. Yeah, let me know when you're ready. Yeah, um, you can take a look at the document that we've got going and scan there. All righty. Yeah, hold on a second. My uh, show was doing some, this to me earlier where it wasn't showing the videos as videos. Just the first still. We'll start drawing that first still while I try to resolve the technical difficulties. Okay. Should I ask questions while you're doing that? Yes, go for it. All right. So, uh, Bill, so people are curious, um, are the gray foxes also in the eastern U.S.? Is, you know, they're asking in Pennsylvania specifically? Yes, they are. Um, they're, they're, they're pretty, they're widespread. There are only a couple places in the country uh, where they do not exist. And so um, uh, pretty much all, all the way through. Okay. So yeah, somebody from North Carolina was curious too. So even in North Carolina, huh? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me, um, let me say this, the, their, their range is uh, from Southern Canada over by the Great Lakes, um, all the way down through the United States, all the way through Mexico, Central America, and Venezuela and Colombia, the northern part of Venezuela and Colombia. <clears throat> that's, that's where the gray fox is. The gray fox originated, genetically it's been shown, originated in Southern California 10 million years ago. Wow. Wow. And um, I believe, and this is just my question too, I believe you said in our, our interview, they haven't um, changed much genetically, right? They don't, they don't interbreed with other, like a red fox, yeah. is that correct? Yeah, yeah they, they cannot interbreed with any other um, uh, canine. And uh, that means then that uh, uh, when you see a gray fox, you're looking at a replica that is 10 million years old. That's amazing. 
-hmm. So speaking of red fox, um, how, what, you know, somebody asked, um, how does the walking style of a red fox compare to a gray fox? Their father saw and them saw something that they thought was a fox last night, but it appeared more bouncy than expected. Hmm. So how would you determine like the difference if you saw a flash of a fox go by, what would be the biggest clue to you to whether it was a red fox or a gray fox? The tip of the tail. The tip of the tail, because the yeah. gray is dark? The, the, the gray fox you can see right there is yeah. uh, black uh, on the tip of its tail. And the uh, uh, red fox is white on the tip of its tail. And um, you can you can see that difference uh, from quite a ways off, uh, and be able to tell the difference between the two. Okay, and I believe the gray fox you mentioned they climb trees, but red fox do not. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So I think you mentioned that makes the gray fox a little harder for dogs to get <laughs> during hunting, right? Right. Because they can get up in the trees. Uh, let me mention something here along those lines. Um, when the, on the East Coast, okay, in Virginia, North Carolina, and in that region, um, back at the beginning of our country, um, the plantations that grew up there were uh, creating a wealth class in this country. And uh, that wealthy class wanted to continue the uh, fox hunting uh, that uh, they do in England, okay? And uh, so they first started out trying to hunt their gray fox, but, but that little old gray fox, all it would do when the dogs were let loose on it would be to climb the nearest tree and sit up there and laugh at you as, <laughs> uh, at, the, at the dogs at the bottom of, uh, of the tree. That's funny. And uh, so uh, what they had to do in order to keep this tradition alive was they had to import red foxes to the East Coast. And that's what they did. That's how come we have red foxes, well, right now, all over the United States and, and elsewhere. It's the most widespread fox of any of the foxes uh, at all. So okay. that's how we got red foxes into this uh, country of ours. Before then, the native peoples always interacted with uh, uh, the, the gray fox. And they considered the gray fox, some, some tribal groups um, considered the gray fox to be the bringer of fire. Uh, others uh, brought um, uh, that, th uh, uh, the gray fox was treated as a god, a creator god, okay? It held very high stature within the belief systems of most of the American Indian populations. That's, a, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, somebody asked if they're more likely hiking in the Bay Area, then you're likely to see a gray fox more than a red fox in this area? Uh, you, you, you turn it around, you're more, more likely to see a red fox. Than oh, okay, because they're more widespread. There's gray fox like that, brush and so forth. And if you're coming, if you're hiking along a trail, let's say for instance, and ahead of you using that same trail is a, a gray fox coming towards you, Okay, that fox knows that you're there way before you even know it's there. And it will duck off into the brush uh, and uh, wait there until you pass by and then it'll resume its journey. Okay. I, I've, I've seen that happen any number of times. Yeah, that's so we probably have, they've seen us hiking but we necessarily haven't seen yeah, them. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How, how vulnerable are the gray fox to predators like coyotes and, and uh, you know, bigger cat, you know, the, like a bobcat or a mountain lion or something, or even owls? Well, a, a bobcat and a coyote, um, mountain lion, 
they they will all uh, prey on gray foxes. I have a friend, uh, Tanya Diamond, who um, had a cameras up in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and she, like me, uses video instead of stills. And here comes this uh, coyote with a gray fox in its mouth. Wow, like an adult gray fox? Yep. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are they fast runners? What, the coyote? The, the gray fox, the can gray they? Fox. Well, I've never, I've never sat down and compared with other uh, wildlife, other animals, but yeah. uh, they, they can, according to the literature, they can um, reach up to 43 miles per hour. Wow. That's yeah, it's pretty fast. Yeah. I saw, I saw one uh, morning um, from a distance of probably good 200 yards, uh, a chase begin, a uh, gray fox chasing a jackrabbit. And lo and behold, they came right at me. <laughs> and um, they came by so fast that I couldn't even get my camera on them. And uh, uh, I watched them go up the road uh, a ways and the jackrabbit outran the gray fox the, because the jackrabbit has more stamina. The gray fox burns out. It, it's fast, but it burns out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, they seem bouncy too, really quick, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see here. You mentioned distemper. Um, we talked a little bit about that, but um, they, the, you can't, uh, there can't be a vaccination program. Is that correct for gray fox? That's like, right. like there are for dogs? Yeah, no. Yeah. Um, when, when I was in communication with uh, uh, Deanna, uh, who's the lead um, veterinarian for the state of California, I asked her about that. And uh, she said that would be so impractical. We couldn't even get to all of them. And mm -hmm. so, uh, and they have to do it when the pups are small. And if they went into a live trapping situation, you'd lose more of those little foxes due to stress than you would, um, you know, than it would be worthwhile to do. So wow. we just have to live with it. It's like diseases that are all over the world. I mean, you have to get along with it somehow. Yeah. 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 That's harsh. Yeah. And um, somebody asked if you're if this is a volunteer project, if there's any volunteer work. Well, there's no volunteer openings right now, but my team consists of nine uh, volunteers. They're spread out across the country. And when we have a board meeting, uh, we're on Zoom right here like this. And uh, uh, I have some really incredible people that have uh, come in and joined me in this venture. Uh, one is uh, David Johns, who is uh, uh, a legend in the conservation movement in that uh, it was his inspiration that started the, uh, both the Y2Y program, which is Yukon to, uh, Yellowstone to Yukon. They're doing corridor work to connect up 2,000 miles uh, along the spine of the continent. Wow. And... Um, um, what was the other one that, uh, oh, oh, Wildlands Network, uh, which is a uh, network, uh, the, a cor another gigantic corridor project that begins in Se the Seattle area and goes into Mexico. And so it will um, come right through I, I talked with Jessica uh, at Wildlands and she said, we're going to go right through your property there. So why don't you hook up and we can use what you uh, develop down in there. And that part of the project is just now getting underway. Oh, great. We've only been a nonprofit for two years. Oh, uh, I didn't know that. That's so, great. Uh, it just sort of evolved into needing to do a 501c3 you know it, it, the evolution of, of the project just said that's the next thing you've got to do and we did it that's great we can't hear you jack yeah, yeah you're <laughs>
Are you muted? You must. I don't see oh, no. you. Muted. Oh, there you are. I'm back. Yeah. Yep. You're back. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> it it also shows us what happens when, um, when a person pays attention and cares and takes action. Um, in order to do appropriate wildlife management, we need to have that based on, on evidence, on sort of really knowing about the behavior of these, these critters. And that comes from the direct observations that you are, are doing. In the nature journaling community, we sometimes talk about questions sort of like you know, there's the let's see questions, there's the could it be questions. There's so much important stuff that you can learn just by sitting and looking. And so an extension of Bill's eyes are that network of cameras. So what he's done is just taken his eyes and taught them how to see in the dark and, um, and put a whole bunch of them out there that never sleep. And the result is we're really getting uh, deep knowledge about the natural history of these organisms from what you observe. That is, that's fantastic. And you, as you folks can see, this has direct conservation um, implications. So policy based on science um, is an outcome that can come from this. And that's, that's really important. Yeah. And um, I really respect what you are doing to get this, um, this, this deeper knowledge and understanding of the organism for the conservation and preservation of these incredible crazy tree climbing foxes. <laughs> and, climbing dogs. Yeah, so <laughs> cool. And, and also this, I've never known that they were like, like the stem canid. And that's going to just make these guys even, I always thought of them, they're, they're, they're sort of, they're, they're, they're different. I sort of thought of them like kind of in their own little corner, but like, like the proto canid. I always sort of envisioned like, no, it's something like the wolf, but like the wolf is junior to this gray fox form that yeah. is crazy yeah. cool. I love that. I absolutely love that. Um, if uh, people want to follow you, learn more about what you're doing, support what you are doing, um, and uh, what, what should we do? Well, um, we do need that support. It's the only way we stay alive out here. And so, you can go on our website and there you will find uh, PayPal and Give Direct uh, buttons that you can uh, make donations uh, to the Urban Wildlife Research Project.com. And uh, that money uh, that uh, you donate will go to help improve the health of the um, general region of all the wildlife that's uh, living along the bay. That's, and I know that there, there are people in this community who have given me incredible support um, and um, through, through donations to support me in the teaching that I do. And if you're considering making a donation to me today, I'm going to encourage you instead of this time, instead of making it to me, which again, I, I, I so appreciate it. And that's what allows my family to eat burritos. <laughs> that's good. But today I would ask that instead of giving a donation to me, if you are able to and inclined to do so, to let's see if we can support this research and this work on, on the foxes. So if, if you are able to, um, please uh, let's, let's step up and see if we can support Bill and his work. Um, if you're not able to, you can also still by just by being an informed citizen following this work and kind of learning about urban wildlife, that makes a difference. And another thing that you can do to make a difference is just an act of kindness or a little micro stewardship moment in your, your day, whether that's, you know, it can be anything from a beach cleanup to picking up a piece of trash to, um, to, to, to whatever you think you can do to, to, to help our community and to, to, to be there for nature. Um, in our society right now, we are desperately in need in, of acts of, of, of stewardship, of kindness in our communities, 
and um, sort of looking out for each other. So anything that we can do to just to, to, to bring a civil connection with each other and nature back into our society is going to, um, is, we're, we're in need of that. But again, I say, if you are able to, to also support Bill's work, um, uh, please do so. And we have the URL in the chat and uh, we are uh, grateful for what you're doing and, and respect that. Um, Marcia, if people want to find out more about you and be provided conservation uh, radio, um, what should we do? Um, you can check out our podcast uh, and show notes on my website. It's uh, www.beprovided.com. Um, the, the podcast is on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast right now. And um, yeah, I just do this for passion. That's my way of giving back and um, sharing the work that um, all you wonderful people are doing to, to help protect our planet. So, so yeah, yeah, feel free to listen. Yeah. What, what's that, Bill? I wanted to drop in something here that yeah. we haven't really touched on. Um, one, of, one of the things that I've learned uh, from the gray foxes is first of all, they are my professors. I am their student. Okay. Everybody write this down. That's a quote. <laughs> and uh, as such, I have been able to see into their emotional world. And their emotional world is just as important as their thinking world. Okay. Maybe even more so. And when I did, when that, when I got that breakthrough in my own being, my own head, it caused me to turn in a new direction as far as my eating habits was concerned. And I'm working my way toward becoming a vegetarian just because of those little foxes that are there. Mm. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, and, and so what I really hear is, so you're, you're paying uh, attention and, and, and thinking about what are the, what are the implications for the, the way that we live our, our lives. That's right. Um, and, you know, when you fall in love with the world, it changes you. It changes you. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, thank you all for being here to everyone in our community. Thank you so much for being here. And I hope that this was a, a, a delightful window into this world for you. We are now going to pivot a little bit to um, a little bit of sharing. So Bill, while this program has been going on, people have been sketching and drawing um, foxes and uh, We'll have a chance to see some of probably some of those pages and also the um, <clears throat> some people have sketches and drawings that they, they did during this week that are not directly Fox related, um, but um, are really inspiring uh, nature journaling pages that uh, that we love to share. So we're going to now jump over to kind of the community cam. So here we have our uh, um, if you would like to share your journal page, um, then just hold it up to your screen. And uh, Bill, we're going to start over in London. Uh, this is our friend. We'd like to introduce him to you. This is uh, Ray Bonto. And um, let's see, we'll, we'll make your screen... Uh, big by getting rid of all of us. And then, um, Melinda, could you make it possible for Ray to yeah. unmute himself? Yes, I <clears throat> So, um, Ray Bonto, you are live with Bill Lycom. Oh, I will. Hold on one moment. Yeah. All right, you should be able to unmute. Ray Bonto, good to have you with us. Yeah. Hello. Uh, here are the sketches. Um, 
So I decided to add paint on some of them. Uh, and uh, and it was quite tricky doing these, and it was really easier to do the these ones. Uh, ah, so those those ones from the moving video, um, like I see that uh, yeah. were that that worked better for you. Uh, no, not for oh, me. Ah, uh, so so the the ones from the photographs were a little bit easier for you. Yes. Yeah, they don't quite bounce around as much, but practicing both of those, that one with the arch back um, down there on the bottom of that, that, that page there, yeah, that one, I mean, that just feels so foxy, doesn't it? And I really like your lines of the back, that line of the back that you're getting on a bunch of those. Really, really successful. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, um, here's the video. Um, and all right, so everybody look how um, sometimes he's just focusing on what's the shape of a back leg? Um, what is the shape of the neck going into the head from this angle? Not everything has to be a complete head to toe fox. So getting little bits and pieces like this is a terrific way to, 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 to get yourself to see and, and record. And it's at, at the start of, of doing this, what happens is you're your inner critic will slam you and try to prevent you from putting any marks down on the page because like, oh, that can't, that's not good enough. But the more you just sort of let these marks happen, then the more drawing from a video like that is going to work for you. And then that translates into drawing from life. Yeah, I also decided to sketch a moose, one of my favorites. Um, uh, and I decided to, Paint it in watercolor instead of pencil because it was more smooth and I could add color pencil over. Oh, that is so so rich. I love those dark values on it. Um, and you get that sense of moose have such crazy long legs. So people who are really familiar with deer will say like, oh no, you got the proportions wrong. But oh no, those are moose proportions. They've got legs for days legs for days pencil miles right do you, do you love that daniki book uh no it's not from there oh. but um, uh, but it's fun i find it fun to, to to look for for to, to for inspiration yeah. yes yeah. it's a fantastic book yeah oh thank you so much for sharing this ray bonto thank you jack thank, thank you. you yeah thank you bill thank you um so now let's see what else. Uh, if you have a journal page to share, just hold it up to your screen and we will find you. You can also use the raise hand function. Um, uh, if you don't want to be um, videoed and put on, uh, the, in, included in the recording, we'll be turning off the recording very soon. And then you can share uh, other pages and things that um, uh, won't be on that, but if you, at this point, would like uh, have anything else to share? All right, um, I'm going to jump over to I see Anne, and then down to Avea. Um, Anne Chadwick from Point Blue Conservation Science. Um, hope you enjoyed a chance to meet another scientist today. Um, um, Anne, good to have you with us. Thank you so much. And it's so great to see the work that Bill is doing. I just love the um, enthusiasm and like you say, the evidence-based conservation and dedication to such great work. So thank you for all you're doing. And um, I had a lot of fun taking notes and you know, they're crepuscular and that the basal uh, canid and, and so on. And then, I think the most fun that came out of mine was this um, two-headed thing. This idea that you've shared with us before, Jack, is it seemed like through the different pictures that you were sharing, there were some where um, the head was all the way down and then it was up a little bit. So I kind of did that off of the same body. Um, so that was, that was fun and I didn't do yeah, it didn't do nearly as much when it got fast with the uh, videos. So, yeah. I, I but but you're willing to try. You're willing to put marks to paper. 
and yeah. that's 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 huge um a big part of that is just being willing to kind of get something down and have that be okay the more that you do it the more the kind of movement and anatomy of these things is going to and proportions just sort of sinks into your brain and your pencil yeah so mm -hmm. that's so thanks for the work you're doing and um marsha i'm going to follow up with you about maybe um i don't know if you've interviewed point blue on any of your podcasts. i did i just messaged you i i a couple mm -hmm. years ago i went out to the point uh point ray station and we did like a live kind of in-person video where we could hear the sounds of the birds and okay. but there's so much work going on i would love to talk to you more about that okay Oh, yeah, I'm, we'll I'm delighted that, that the thank two you. of you are connecting. Yeah, That's a great you. connection. <laughs> thank Thanks. you so much. Thanks, Jack. Great. Um, thank you. Avea, good to have you with us. It is so good to be here. Um, that, that was just wonderful. That just I'm so galvanized right now. I can't even put proper words to it. So thank you. So, so, so Bill, if you don't know, um, Avea, in addition to being a nature journaler, is a really um, avid um, steward of, um, of, of of plant communities up in San Francisco. She's also just really active on the ground, like yourself, going out on a regular basis, um, working uh, in conservation. Good. Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Avea. Please continue. Oh, no, not at all. I, I'm, so, I'm so excited. So thank you for putting into words why I'm so excited. Um, as soon as COVID kind of mellows out, I'm hoping to go back to some restoration sites in the Presidio up here. Um, also just wanted to, to share the, um, the, the fast sketching because I love the practice of the fast sketching. So thank you for this, Jack. Um, like just today getting to do quick sketches like this. And like you said, sometimes you don't get everything like, okay, this one doesn't have a tail, so what? Um, <sighs> because just being getting to do it, you, you play with so many different concepts at once at warp speed. Like, like maybe um, the one at nighttime, you're like, oh, what an interesting, um, what is it? Um, oh yeah, what interesting um, negative space that you get to explore here. Or, okay, maybe you just look closely at a face for once, or, you know, just like the different postures and um, what else? Or then like, you know, trying to get the different behaviors down. And what I find fun about these is like you said, it's freeing. And I think that we get so tied to getting worried about how our pictures look, but it's about exploring. And so I'm going to just recommend if people have this kind of stuff in their journals, please post it up on Fearless Fridays, because this is nature journaling too. Um, and sometimes this is all you get in the field. So just you know, be fearless about it and be proud of, of any of the marks that you put on your page. Um, so just thank you. This was super duper fun today. Thank you. Great. I'm so glad you're here. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm now going to turn off the recording. Um, for, so before I do, um, let me see. Um, I just, uh, again, thank you everybody for being here. Thank you for sharing. Um, encourage people to go and um, uh, check out Bill's work um, online. And um, this is this is how we, as a community of stewards, and naturalists, and 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 people who care, can really make a difference. Um, and again, it's evidence based um, ev evidence based science based research. Um, so science science based um, conservation and stewardship. So this is. Is, is really wonderful to have you with us. Um, and let's see, where is, okay, no, there, there you are. Um, so, sir, thank you again um, so much. We're now gonna about to turn off the recording, um, but it was really amazing to uh, get a chance to look into this world with you. Well, thank you for inviting me. You know, that's just as important. <laughs> 